For some, Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. But for others, especially those that have lost someone around Christmas, whether naturally or criminally, this time of year is something that's dreaded. I lost my grandmother six years ago around Christmas and it's still very hard, especially this time of the year. Here are four of the most heartbreaking and disturbing cases that took place around Christmas. On Christmas Eve in 2011, William Wallace and Zazel Preston returned from a party at a neighbor's house. The two of them got into an argument and William pushed Zazel into a glass table. Her young daughter helped William pull pieces of glass from her mother's body and then he carried Zazel's body to the bathroom to clean her up. He ended up dropping her and her head hit the side of the toilet seat. He then dragged her cold, lifeless body into bed. On Christmas morning, he dragged her into their living room and he put sunglasses on her and set her on the couch. He told her daughters to open the presents next to their mother and according to prosecutors, William told the children, mommy got drunk and ruined Christmas. Her daughters were three and eight and they were from a previous relationship. Her family had begged her not to marry him because he was so abusive, but unfortunately she didn't take their advice. Thankfully, William was convicted of second-degree murder and he was sentenced to 15 years, so he's due to be released from prison in 2036. That just doesn't seem long enough. Zazel was actually in college to become a domestic violence counselor and was only weeks away from graduating. Her mother has custody of her children. In 1992, in St. Charles, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago, David and Sharon Shu decided to take a nine-day vacation to Mexico for Christmas, but they were going without their four and nine-year-old daughters. They didn't leave them with a grandparent or another family member. They left them completely alone. Home Alone 2 was actually in the theaters at the time, and they were dubbed the Home Alone couple by the media. The girl's grandmother had actually asked if she could take care of the girls while they were on vacation, but Sharon told her that a babysitter had already been arranged. And Mike, I'm standing right in front of the Shoes house. All their neighbors say tonight they're disappointed. They waited all day to hear the couple's side of the story. Why David and Sharon Shoe jetted off to Mexico but left their two young daughters home alone during Christmas. Tonight, neighbors here say they're still waiting. The Shoes neighbors along Nancy Lane say they were hoping for a good answer as to why Nicole and Diana were left home alone. I don't think this uh, attorney really gave any answers for what happened. He really had no explanation for why they would leave the two girls home alone. I'm a little disappointed. Um, they kind of promised the world that they were going to have a reason why this all took place. And I guess they still haven't come up with a good one. Connie and Bill Stadelman live right across the street from the Shoes Tudor home. Tonight, they, like most of their neighbors, say they're critical of the Shoes and their attorney for calling a news conference but not answering reporters' key questions. No one would have even known that the girls were alone if their fire alarm hadn't gone off. It went off because they accidentally overflowed the tub and that caused an electrical short that set off the alarm. Once the alarm went off, they ran barefoot in the snow to a neighbor's house. The neighbor said the girls were screaming and they only had on shorts and t-shirts. So he took the girls to his home where his mother wrapped the girls in blankets. She gave them peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a bag of gummy bears. The neighbor called the police and CPS agents took the girls into custody. They had been alone for two days at that point. Their parents weren't due back for another seven days. The shoes didn't have a clue that they had been found out, so when they returned to O'Hare International Airport on December the 29th, police, angry onlookers, and a crowd of reporters were there to greet them. They were both sentenced to two years of probation, 200 hours of community service, and less than $1,000 in fines and court costs. The girls were later adopted.
dejaba atropellar a la niña. Around 4.40 Central Time on November 21st, 2021 in Waukesha, Wisconsin, Darrell Brooks Jr. was driving his mother's Red Ford Escape as he plowed through barricades that were in place because the city's annual Christmas parade was going on. He had been involved in a domestic disturbance with his ex-girlfriend Erica Patterson and he fled the scene. This is when he calmly drove several blocks hitting parade goers in a zigzag pattern, even after police attempted to stop him. Shortly after the attack, Darrell knocked on a man's door, told him he was homeless and asked to use his phone so that he could call an Uber. The man had been out hunting and had just gotten home, so he wasn't aware of what had just happened at the parade. So he was being kind and he let Darrell inside his home, he gave him a sandwich and let him borrow a jacket. Darrell was later arrested without incident after he left the man's home. During the trial, he represented himself and it was a mess, but he did make sense at times. I watched a lot of the trial and he was constantly interrupting, referring to himself in third person, saying that he didn't consent to being referred to as Darrell Brooks, that he didn't know anyone by that name, and he was being extremely disrespectful. He started interrupting Judge Jennifer Darrow less than two minutes into day one of the trial. He even rolled his eyes as family members of those that he killed or injured were on the stand. In October of this year, he was found guilty on 76 counts. For counts one through six, he received life with no possibility of parole. One life sentence for each life that he took. For counts 7 through 67, he was found guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety with the use of a deadly weapon. He received 17 and a half years for each of the 62 people he injured. On counts 68 through 73, he was found guilty of hit and run causing death and received 25 years for each of those counts. On counts 74 and 75, he was found guilty of two counts of felony bail jumping. And for count 76, he was found guilty of misdemeanor battery. We never learned what the motive was. He said he doesn't know why he did it. 16-year-old Laura Taylor said to her friends, let's get some drama in our lives. And that's exactly what they did. On Christmas Eve, the worst crime spree in Dayton, Ohio's history occurred. The gang members were Marvellus King, 19, Heather Matthews, 20, and Demarcus Smith, 19. They called themselves the Downtown Posse. They spent a lot of time drinking and were often seen downtown at Courthouse Square asking for money. They didn't have jobs, but they had a lot of idle time. Spree killers are very violent and they often choose their victims at random and they tend to kill because they enjoy it. On Thursday, December the 24th, their first victim, Joseph Wilkerson, was shot to death in his home at 3321 Prescott Avenue. Laura Taylor and her boyfriend, Marvellus, came up with a plan to get some money. Laura figured that Joseph would pay for sex, so she called him and promised him a threesome with Heather. He was later found tied to his headboard with electrical cords. While he was tied up, they found a 32 caliber derringer that Marvelous used to shoot him in the chest. Laura then proceeded to shoot him in the head. They then ransacked his house, partied for the next three days and ate his food while he lay dead. They also took his car. He wasn't found until December the 26th. Danita Gallett was a senior at Dayton's Patterson Cooperative High School and the mother of a two-year-old daughter named Dominique. On Christmas Eve, as she was using a payphone at 517 Neal Avenue, she was shot five times as she begged them not to shoot her. They took her coat, her backpack, her filas, and the 50 cents that she had in her pockets. She was the first victim to be found. And after this, they went right back to Joseph Wilkerson's house. 
Also, on December the 24th, around 12.30 a.m., Jeffrey Wright, 28, was shot four times in the legs at 157 Yuma Place. He was Heather's ex-boyfriend, and police say that he was shot because he knew too much about the gang. He was able to run to a neighbor's house, and he survived. The four of them went to the home of Richmond Maddox, 19. He was Laura's ex-boyfriend. She coaxed him out of the house and into his car. Marvellus and Heather drove behind them. Richmond became suspicious once he saw those two behind him, so he sped up. Laura then shoots him once in the head while he was still driving on Benton Avenue. And this caused him to hit a small tree. Laura then jumped out of the car and ran from the scene. The day after Christmas, Sarah Abraham was opening the shortstop mini market at 1201 West 5th Street when Laura walked in to case the police. A few minutes later, Demarcus Smith and Marvellus walked in. Marvellus shot Sarah twice in the head. They wanted the money in the cash register. She showed it to them and she told them to take it, but he still chose to shoot her. They left with $44. She died five days later. A customer, Joseph Pettis, was also shot, but thankfully he survived. Also on the 26th, a woman was airing up her tires at a Salem Avenue gas station when her Dodge Shadow was stolen at gunpoint. A police sergeant later spotted her car on Kilmer Avenue while the four of them were inside. They were arrested and several weapons were confiscated. One of the detectives later found out that Laura had actually told Marvellus to shoot him, but fortunately he didn't. On Sunday, December the 27th, police received a tip and found Wendy Cottrell, 16, and Marvin Washington, 18, at a city-owned gravel dump. They had also been shot to death. On the witness stand, Heather said they believed Wendy and Marvin would tell police what they had done, so they had to get rid of them. After they shot Sarah, the four picked up Wendy and Marvin and bought some alcohol. Marvella said he needed to go to the bathroom, so he pulled into a gravel yard on Richley Drive. DeMarcus and Marvellus ordered them out of the car, walked them behind a large pile of dirt, and shot them. They weren't found until the four were in custody. And Sergeant George Hammond said they were like sharks. Once they tasted blood, they couldn't stop. 